Can we talk for a second about Francis and Gone? First off, I was scared of him before. Mm -hmm. Because if he hits you, you're going to die. He's an incredible athlete, and what he has over everybody is power. Francis hits you, you don't get up. Francis hits you, you hit the canvas. He's a scary, scary man. He's the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Francis Ngannou is one of the best arguments for carrying a gun. He got that big from working in a fucking sand mine. Oh my God. Tell me what it was like growing up. I have a very difficult childhood. I couldn't just have a normal life at, as other kids. The life there uh, was so miserable. Being a child, I kind of like have a virtual war in my mind. A war with a perfect family that we could have eat three meals a day, go to school, have friends, go back home. When it was so hard for me, I could have escaped, go in that war who was just in my mind. And you want to talk about an amazing story that's like right out of a movie. The guy was homeless, came from Africa where he worked in a fucking sand mine, gets to the number one contender spot in the UFC. Tough life taught me not expect anything from anybody. That's why I'm a champion. I never let anything control me. It's my choice. How would I like to be remembered? As a free man who did whatever he wanted to do. In May of this year, a tragedy occurred in Spain. About 2,000 people approached the enclave of Melilla at dawn from Morocco. More than 500 managed to enter a border control area after cutting a fence with shears. Melilla is just one of two Spanish enclaves that border Africa making it a dream destination for many Africans who search for a better life and a means of providing for their families by migrating to Europe. That fateful morning, their hopes were decimated by police forces who met the migrants with force. The videos are horrific, dozens of bodies strewn around, many of them lifeless. More than 20 migrants lost their lives that day. Dozens more were injured or missing. Hundreds prevented from achieving their most coveted dreams, freedom to pursue happiness. Watching the video in Las Vegas, a man recognized the border area. He too was there nine years ago and could have just as easily have been one of the lifeless bodies on the ground. That man is Francis Ngannou, the heavyweight champ of the UFC and a man whose incredible journey to freedom and wealth began by undergoing one of the most horrific paths to liberation one could ever make. Now known as the hardest recorded puncher in the world and the fifth pound for pound fighter in the UFC rankings, Francis Ngannou, the heavyweight champion of the world, lived a much different life before making his way to MMA stardom. To take a deep dive into the life he once lived, it's essential that we go back a few years to the time of Baby Francis, born on September 5, 1986 in the Batia village in Cameroon. As a kid, Francis Ngannou and his family lived in poverty, and he had very little formal education. This made things worse for his parents, and when he turned six years of age, his parents got a divorce and sent him to live with his aunt. After my parents get divorced, I was six years old. I started to live in a different family and then trying to have friends and then was always like uh, rejected or something. I had to work and it wasn't enough. At school, um, they would point me out amongst other kids to be the one that doesn't have it pen to take note or okay. keep notebook. Teachers, they don't understand why you don't have a book. You should tell your parents so they can buy it for you. 
they don't understand that you can just afford it you know your parent can't hasn't paid a scholar fee so they're gonna kick me out in front of other kids so yes nobody is excited to be a friend with that guy at just age 10, Francis got a job at a sand quarry in the Batier village in the hope of making some extra income for himself and his family. We had to work to contribute at home. I always feel like I miss my childhood. It's something mm. missing in it because uh, it's been too much frustration. A sand quarry is a place where sand is extracted so it can be sold to other users. Just as you would expect, this is an arduous job, especially since sand becomes quite heavy in large amounts. This is the kind of back-breaking work that Francis was doing from age 10. Your body must develop very strong from doing something like that. Oh, definitely. How long did you have to work in these uh, sand mines? I left school, I was 17. During his childhood, Francis' father was a street fighter and was very well known in the village for getting into brawls on the streets. People in the village would mock Francis and his family over his father's behavior. I was kind of like ashamed of my dad. Why ashamed? Because he had this reputation of being a street fighter, like fighting people and people were like, oh, that guy. As Francis grew up, he was approached by a couple of street gangs in his village who wanted him to become a part of their gangs. He refused and used his father's negative rep as a street fighter as the motivation he needed to pursue something more respectable. I do believe that because he was there to show me maybe not the way to go, but the way not to go, then I'm like, I don't want to become like that. Fast forward to 12 years after he started working at the sand quarry, Francis Ngannou decided to start training in boxing, even though his family was against it. I love fighting since I was a kid. Um, that was my passion. Everything that I could have done and enjoyed, like go out there mm -hmm. in the banana farm and just kick and punch those, those banana tree until they fell down. I really looked back at that time, like just being angry with my parents. I was like a bad seed. Nobody ever believed in me when I came up with the idea of fighting. I went against their wills. For some point, I was just a bad guy that couldn't listen to what they were telling him. This didn't stop him from training, and he kept at it for one year until he had to stop due to illness. From the age of 23 to 26, Francis Ngannou did various odd jobs to survive and make ends meet. As he became an adult, he ended up frustrated with his life's direction. He saw no opportunity with the life he had, and he came to a belief that there was hardly any chance of him achieving greatness in Cameroon. He always wanted a better life for himself a way to provide and take care of his family, and the opportunity to fulfill a dream he had deep inside, as he always believed that he was destined for greatness. And it was my motivation because despite my situation at the time, I always believed that this is gonna happen. How? I don't know, but it's gonna happen. Then I'm like, yes, I'm gonna do it. With that in mind, at 26 years old, he decided to migrate to Paris, France to pursue a career in professional boxing. Talking about his life in his village and his migration to Cameroon has never been pleasant for this MMA superstar. He usually speaks in a quiet voice that drops to almost inaudible levels when he's hard pressed to remember the trouble that drove him to seek a new path. Clearly, he doesn't particularly enjoy talking about his decision to leave a life of abject poverty in the hopes of finding something, literally anything, better in a foreign land. He once said, I left Cameroon just to try and have a life, to survive. When I was in Cameroon, I just didn't see a way. I could survive, but that's about it. With that notion and a little more than a dream, one most people would have considered an unrealistic one at that, Francis Ngannou packed up his bags and made the journey of over 3,100 miles from Cameroon to France in the hopes of finding a better life. In a country where the average citizen takes home roughly $1,300 per year, he believed the prospects of a bright future were slim, but they existed nonetheless.
Francis Ngannou's dream of becoming a professional boxer was fueled by a love for watching prime Mike Tyson, and this made him think that boxing might provide a way out of poverty. He said he was the youngest guy to be champion, 18 or 19 or something like that, and I knew I couldn't do what he did, but I still believed that I could do something great. And I always watch boxing because my dream was to box and that was like my motivation to watch Mike Tyson on uh, YouTube. And I was watching it, I'm like, damn, I gonna do this. I gonna do this. Francis planned at least to take a shot at the life he always dreamed about. And if it didn't work out, he would move on. However, he knew that he needed persistence and perseverance. He said, it won't happen if you don't try. I said to myself to give some time to my dream. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm going to try. Francis Ngannou finally began his journey to France. However, even that wasn't as smooth as he would have hoped. I went country to country. Yeah, I wore, took car, any kind of transportation that uh, I was able to. I spent one year in Morocco trying to cross the continent to go to Europe. It was just like being in hell. Sometimes we live in the forest, hiding for the cops, trying to cross the border to go to Spain. You don't even have clothes. You don't have what to eat, it smell like shit. We've been in some situation that at some point you didn't care as much even about your life. We have to hide because we, we didn't know who was the police or not. Detectives, yeah. Crash us, yes. We have to go eat in the trash, rotten food. I was even surprised that we get uh, out there healthy. Luckily, after one year, uh, I made it in Europe. When he reached Europe, he was sent to jail for two months in Spain for illegally crossing the border. We get incarcerated by the Spain Homeland Security for about two months. We just make sure that we get there with no ID on us because they can deport you if they don't have a proof of ID that means you come from there. And after two months, they free us. After his release from jail, Francis made his way to Paris. Things weren't any better for him when he arrived in Paris. He was homeless, had no friends, and was sleeping on the streets of Paris. This was no surprise to him, mainly because he had nothing with him. However, he was so desperate to learn how to box that he was even willing to endure the elements and sleep on the streets in a foreign land. He didn't see it as humiliating, as it was, in essence, a means to an end. In the beginning, Paris wasn't any better than Cameroon, and Francis said, It's very difficult when you arrive at a place like Paris, and you don't have anyone, but for me, it was an opportunity. At the time, I didn't even have a place to sleep. I didn't have anything. But I didn't care about that because I was happy. I was happy because I knew this was an opportunity for me to make something of myself and to progress. His difficult life lasted for about two months, with him sleeping in a car park wearing only a sleeping bag for comfort. Francis later took up a voluntary role at a homeless shelter called La Shorba, where he worked by chopping up vegetables in the kitchen. La Shorba was a non-profit organization aimed at providing 900 free meals per day for the homeless in Paris. La Shorba Charity Foundation Director, Kater Yenbu, took an interest in the hulking specimen, who was always busy and would find ways to make himself useful in the kitchen. After learning what his goal in life was, Kater Yenbu spoke to friend Didier Carment that he had a volunteer who wanted to become a boxer. Didier Carmen, who became Francis Ngannou's best friend, completely changed his life when he introduced him to Fernand Lopez at the MMA factory in Paris. Being a fan of Mike Tyson and having dreamed of being a professional boxer, Francis saw no reason to train for anything other than that at the MMA factory. The coach, Fernand Lopez, agreed to teach him how to box, even though Francis had no money to pay him. I didn't have nothing, not even mouthpiece, 
no wrap to wrap my hand, no glove. The guy uh, named Didier Carmont, he gave me a glove and some clothes. Even a perfume, who was very nice. <laughs> Fernand Lopez was quickly impressed, especially since Francis is a large, powerful, athletic man. But he had other ideas for him. Fernand Lopez saw his potential in MMA and convinced him to try mixed martial arts instead. Francis had never heard of MMA until that moment. Fernand Lopez recalled, My colleague called me and said there was a huge guy asking to train in the gym. The next day, I got to the gym and Francis was there. I talked with him and I gave him two bags full of clothes and stuff like gear and gloves. And I said, Please train MMA. Then I'm like, what's MMA? And I'm like, it's mixed martial art. But what's mixed martial art? What does that mean? They have to explain me all those things. Now I'm like, okay, since I just have my time. The very same day, he did an MMA class for beginners. He didn't know anything about MMA, but the way he was moving and the way he was thinking, he was so smart and such a fast learner, not to mention so incredibly strong. I knew if he kept training, he would be a champion. What Francis did during the training session excited Fernan Lopez, and what he did immediately afterward made Fernan Lopez realize that Francis was going to need more than just coaching. He said he has to keep his bags in the gym because outside wasn't safe for him. That's the moment I knew he was homeless. I offered for him to sleep in the gym. Meanwhile, we started to work on everything to get him a decent place to live. Francis dreamed of being a boxing champion, but with Fernand Lopez's help, his attention was directed towards MMA. As the coach recalls, the transformation was complete once Nganu made his pro debut in November 2013, saying he just fell in love with MMA. Fernand Lopez did a lot for Francis Ngannou, especially when he gave him some MMA gear and allowed him to train and sleep in the gym for no cost, which led to the beginning of his MMA career. Vernon saw unlimited potential in this raw, powerful athlete who was willing to do whatever it took to succeed. With the help of Fernand Lopez and the MMA Factory, Francis Ngannou kept up with his MMA training for three months. And in November 2013, he finally had his first match. He fought mostly in the French promotion 100% Fight and the well-regarded French Crossfight Camp, as well as other regional promotions in Europe. Crossfight Camp has been the home base of various UFC fighters like Taylor Lapalus and Mikhail Lebote, along with former Bellator champ Christian Mpumbu and title challenger Carl Amasu. In a country where full, unified rules MMA isn't even legal, Crossfight seems to be building some of Europe's top fighters. When Francis Ngannou made his debut in November 2013, he secured a win in the first round via submission. By April 2014, he had won his first heavyweight tournament and was well and truly on the radar of the UFC. He rebounded with four consecutive stoppage victories despite losing via decision in his second professional match. Having amassed a 5-1 record in the combat sport in such a short time, he was bound to get noticed by the big promotions in MMA. And in December 2015, the UFC reached out to Francis Ngannou, offering him a contract with the promotion. UFC uh, was the opportunity right there who came to me I had to take it, I had to take the opportunity. This came as a surprise to a lot of people, especially since Francis Ngannou had only been fighting in the sport for about three years prior to his UFC debut. However, 
When he got into the octagon and everyone saw him fight, they quickly understood why he garnered so much attention. His debut match in the UFC was against Brazilian martial artist Luis Enrique. This wasn't a good debut match for the Brazilian martial artist, especially since he had been in the sport longer than Francis Ngannou, with more wins. The match occurred on December 19, 2015 at the Amway Center in Orlando, Florida, and aired live on Fox 17. Luis Enrique was riding on the strength of a six-match winning streak, of which four were by stoppage. He had fought outside of his home country just once, and that was a 2012 TKO loss to UFC middleweight Sultan Aliyev in Lebanon. On the other hand, Francis Ngannou came in on a four-match winning streak, all of which were stoppages. He had defeated the likes of William Balduti with a second round TKO, amongst others with a variation of submissions and a first round knockout. When the debut match between Luis Enrique and Francis Ngannou took place, the first round didn't end well for Francis Ngannou as Luis Enrique was on top and tried to capitalize on his advantage. On the other hand, the second round took a different turn as Francis landed a few combinations before landing a devastating left uppercut, which sent Luis Enrique crashing to the floor. Francis Ngannou followed it with a smashing hammer fist on the canvas, but by that time, Luis Enrique was already out like a light from the devastating blow on the feet. This turned out to be an amazing debut for Francis Ngannou, especially since he had to cut weight and managed to knock his opponent out. He admitted he was a bit nervous about the fight and said, That was my first fight, and I was a little bit nervous, but I kept on with how I know how to fight, which is stay on my feet. While Luis Enrique lost his six-match winning streak, Francis went on to have a five-match winning streak, and this was only the beginning. After the event, Francis stated that such massive fight-ending blows are sort of second nature to him. He said, The main thing was not to rush any time. Just be ready to pull out what I've been training for for months, so I don't need to set up some things. I can feel it in the boxing, that's my thing. I can feel it, I have the timing for that. His next match was against Curtis Blades on April 10th, 2016 at UFC Fight Night 86 at Zagreb Arena in Zagreb, Croatia. It was Curtis Blades' debut match and it aired on Fox Sports 1. Curtis was coming from a series of wins as he had stopped all five of his professional opponents via TKO including a stoppage of Luis Cortez in his last fight at RFA 34. However, the match didn't go so well. Some would even say that Francis gave Curtis Blades a rude welcome to the big leagues. Big straight left and Blades wobble. Ooh, he, is he may not recover from that one. Big counter left by Francis Ngannou. Left hand lands for Ngannou. At the end of the round, we're right back. Curtis's right eye was almost completely closed from earlier punches thrown by his opponent. And Francis took his time trying to find ways to keep picking him apart. His destructive strikes damaged Curtis's right eye to the point where it was entirely closed by the second round. Knee for Curtis Blades. And though the newcomer survived the round, the cage side doctor had another opinion. By the time Curtis Blades headed to his stool after the second round, the cage side doctor took a close look at his eye, and with it swollen shut, he shut the fight down. With that conclusion, the result was a TKO stoppage win for Francis Ngannou, and the first loss in Curtis Blades' career. With another win in the bag, Francis said, I'm very happy with the victory, and I proved today that I'm not just a striker or a boxer like people think. I showed people today what I can do and prove that I'm an MMA fighter. In his next fight on July 23, 2016, 
Francis faced another debutante. Boyan Mihailovic aired on Fox 20. This was quite the relief as the fighters were initially scheduled to fight at UFC Fight Night 86. But Boyan was ultimately pulled from the card without any reason. Boyan made his official UFC debut after a 13-year pro run in Europe. The Serbian fighter started his career with three losses before making a rebound with a 10-fight winning streak, six of which came by a stoppage. Unlike Francis Ngannou's previous matches in the UFC, this match lasted 94 seconds in the first round. During the fight, Boyan was cornered by Francis, who connected with a left hand that made Boyan spill to the canvas. Following that, he had little answer for Francis' follow-ups, which forced ref Herb Dean to step in. Boyan protested the stoppage, but his fetal defense proved a feeble counter-argument to ref Herb Dean's action. Just before the fight was stopped, he took several hammer fists that seemed to have stunned him and he wasn't moving to improve his position. With that, Boyan's 10-fight winning streak ended, and Francis went to three undefeated matches. This match was followed by his next bout against Anthony Hamilton on December 9, 2016, at UFC Fight Night 102. Anthony signed with the UFC in 2014 and has alternated wins and losses in all six of his fights. Francis came into this fight as the biggest favorite on the fight card and didn't disappoint. Considering Francis' reputation for violent knockout finishes, it was no surprise that his opponent looked for a takedown early on in this fight. However, Francis showed some new tricks when he used a Kimura lock on Anthony and he used it to make him tap just under two minutes into the fight. He there she got it! Wow! Francis Ngannou by submission round one! Francis the Predator Ngannou! After the fight, Francis Ngannou said, This is something we drilled a lot because everyone thinks that I'm only a striker. I wanted to show my submission game, and I want to fight someone in the top 10 so I can prove that I'm ready for a shot at the belt. With his win in this match, he earned his first UFC Performance of the Night bonus worth $50,000. It's clear Francis Ngannou was learning, and he was learning fast. For a man who began fighting in his late 20s, he showed the UFC he was the real deal. It's no surprise, the man was always working a job harder than most, since the age of 10. The work ethic and desire was always there, MMA was just the way to prove it. When I was walking to the octagon, bro, you have to kill me. I'm not fighting you, I'm fighting my life. I'm fighting whatever can be a problem in my family that I have to solve. So all those things together was my motivation. He faced Andre Arlovsky next on January 28, 2017 at UFC on Fox 23. Arlovsky entered the match having lost three consecutive fights in the previous year via stoppage, though he was ranked the number eight heavyweight on the UFC's rankings. Unfortunately for him, his streak took another hit when Francis knocked him out just 92 seconds into their fight, also earning his second performance of the night bonus. I don't know why, but I think now I start to have the experience in UFC because I'm very, very confident and very relaxed. I know you're standing at the back of the room, you hear Dana talking to you that he believes you could be a future UFC champion. How do you feel when you hear the boss making those type of comments? It made me happy. It made me confident. Francis Ngannou has only spent the last three years training in martial arts. Can you become a UFC champion with five years of, of training and fighting experience? That seems very strange to me. His next match was against veteran Alistair Overeem, a heavyweight contender. 
on December 2, 2017 at UFC 218. It was known as the highest profile fight of his career. Francis Ngannou won the fight via a first round knockout. With Ngannou! which has been labeled as one of the greatest and most brutal knockouts of all time. He is a monster. He's terrifying. To see how far he sent over his head. That's probably the, the most iconic MMA fighting photo that there is. You see that one where his head is just yeah. completely knocked back? That, that picture seems like the coming of the new king. He said, I feel very good. I will get the title shot against Stipe because I am the winner. I'm ready for that. I'm more ready than ever. After the fight, Francis Ngannou signed a new eight-fight contract with the UFC and earned the chance to face Stipe Miocic for the UFC Heavyweight Championship title. Francis was invited to the UFC Performance Institute in Las Vegas, where scientists and analysts wanted to run routine tests to determine how hard he hit. Vice President of the UFC Performance Institute, Duncan French, wanted to record his two most deadly punches, his overhand right and off-balance uppercuts, which had rendered Andre Arlovsky and Alistair Overeem unconscious. At the time, the hardest punch ever recorded was by Tyrone Spong, who managed to record a score of 114,000 units with his attempt. Francis Ngannou threw his overhand right with such power and force that it broke the record, clocking in 129,161 units. To prove it wasn't a fluke, he delivered an equally stunning score with his off-balance uppercuts, reaching a whopping 122,000 units. According to Duncan French and his team of expert analysts, Francis was able to generate about 92.84 horsepower with his shots, which is the equivalent to a small family car. He just hits fucking unbelievably yeah. hard. I can't believe that you said he got 120. 129. 129, that's so crazy! Wow. His hands are so big. Every time I shake his hands, I'm like, how is that a person? Speaking of all things huge, this is a big fight ahead. Stipe Miocic against the man that everyone <laughs> is talking about right now, Francis Ngannou. Stipe is so fucking tough. Stipe Miocic has proved himself as the heavyweight champion. Obviously, there's, there's this huge hype around Ngannou, and, and rightly so. I mean, he's a terrifying individual. Well, you saw what he did to Overeem. Mm. K-1 Grand Prix champion, dream champion, strike force heavyweight champion. Francis put him into orbit. But do you ever feel like, uh, maybe the UFC wouldn't mind seeing, seeing another big Francis knockout on, in, in Boston? I'm sorry, but it's not gonna happen. And Miocic is light years ahead as far as technique goes with Ngannou. But raw physical attributes is what makes Ngannou the unknown commodity. With all this hype and hysteria, Francis was launched into a number one contender spot to face Stipe Miocic at UFC 220 in January 2018 in Boston. Match day came, and unfortunately, it turned out to be confirmation of Stipe Miocic's UFC title reign. Right over the top of the jab of Ngannou. Beautiful tie takedown. Miocic getting the ground. Hammerson got the champ. Beautiful! He's hurt! But right now he's not recovered. Forget about if he got the takedown or not. Oh. Seconds and counting. Oh, flying knee attempt. Mixed martial arts effort here tonight. They are standing and cheering in Boston. While the match was the most anticipated UFC heavyweight fight in years, it ended with Miocic defeating Francis via unanimous decision by scoring a 50-44 across the board. With that win, Stipe Miocic became the first UFC heavyweight champion in history to successfully defend the title three consecutive times. Tonight I learned and underestimate my opponent. 
and I discovered some new part of this program that I ignored. I learned a lot tonight. He hits hard and all that stuff like that, but now that dude's still gonna be more dangerous now. He's gonna fucking take that loss and oh, come back. Oh yeah, man. I did a mistake and that that sh would not happen again. He's just begun. Yeah, he just begun Five like years ago, he didn't know shit. No, no, he's he's just... way better now than he was two fights ago. He's just a special athlete. No, no, and if no. he keeps going, man, I mean, boy. A few months after his title fight, in May 2018, Francis Ngannou created the Francis Ngannou Foundation, a charity that offers people in the Batia village the chance to achieve their dreams the same way he has. I had like a really good friend of mine. This guy is in the village and he said, you just going in America and come back here means a lot to us. Like that means it's possible for us too. He built the first official gym in his hometown with the vision of opening even more gyms across Africa. The nonprofit organization offers a safe space and a learning environment for kids and offers the basics of sportsmanship. I like to like tell this kid, listen, as long as you believe in something, in a dream and believe in yourself, I think a success is just a matter of time. His next match would take place on July 7, 2018 at UFC 226 against Derek Lewis. Derek Lewis was enjoying a streak of wins as he had won seven of his last eight fights, six of which had come by TKO. In what was labeled as a snooze fest and described as the worst heavyweight fight of all time, Derek Lewis won via decision against a pathetically tepid Francis Ngannou. Is think they're entertaining themselves. This is crazy. This is so strange to watch. Definitely not the guy we saw early. That's not. He's throwing a jab from way outside. He's throwing kicks from way outside. It's one of those things you always wonder. How is this fighter going to come back from his first real defeat? Oh, and Francis Ngannou throws a strike after the horn. You got to lead to more booze from the assembled masses here. That's one of the worst heavyweight fights I've ever seen in my life, if not the worst. This was such a bad fight that both fighters didn't even bother with a post-fight interview. It was the worst heavyweight fight I've ever seen. Go to Francis Ngannou's uh, Instagram. He released a statement today. Weird that he would have fear from the last fight. And I'm sure we got fucking owned. He thought he was the man, and then he got owned. UFC boss Dana White believed that Francis Ngannou let his ego run away with him. He said, big time. I can tell you that his ego absolutely ran and did run away with him. The minute that happens to you in the fight game, you start to fall apart. I had some personal encounters with him, as did other people in the organization, and this guy's ego was so out of control. Ego is what hurt Francis Ngannou. After this loss, Francis Ngannou had a rematch against Curtis Blades on November 24th, 2018, in the main event at UFC Fight Night 141. On the other side of the page, Curtis Razor Blades. Francis Ngannou finally made a comeback and displayed his dreadful knockout power yet again when he finished Curtis Blades via TKO in under a minute. Oh! Over the top with the right hand! Because Blades' recovery still won't be on his feet. Mark Goddard's taking a closer look. Ngannou's powering in. Oh, this is bad news! That's it! been a hard time, but listen man, I'm back. He also earned a $50,000 performance of the night bonus for his victory. What a power shot over the top from Francis Ngannou! He's back! Former heavyweight champion, 
Cain Velazquez, who just finished dealing with injuries, returned to the octagon against Francis Ngannou in the main event for UFC's inaugural event on ESPN on February 17, 2019 in Phoenix. Match day arrived and Francis needed just 26 seconds to win the heavyweight bout after unleashing a barrage of hammer fists that ended the fight in a rapid fashion. After the match, he said, I'm back. You'll see me a lot. I hope you enjoyed it. I've been waiting for this fight for three years. I wanted to prove myself against someone like Kane, and I'm glad I had the opportunity. Afterward, he faced former heavyweight champion Junior Dos Santos at UFC on ESPN3 on June 29, 2019. As the fight was ongoing, Francis Ngannou landed a shot behind the ear that stumbled Dos Santos. JDS then turned his back, and Francis Ngannou snuck in an uppercut that dropped him. Some ground strikes later, Francis won the fight by a technical knockout in the first round. This fight, which only lasted 71 seconds, earned him the Performance of the Night Award of $50,000. He was later scheduled to face Jair Zinho Rosenstreich on March 28, 2020. Breaking news. What? Breaking news. I don't like this. What? I'm not gonna like what? UFC 249 has been canceled. The event was ultimately postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The fight was rescheduled to happen on April 18, 2020 at UFC 249. However, on April 9th, UFC boss Dana White declared that the event was postponed. The California State Athletic Commission had canceled all combat sporting events until May 31st. But the ban didn't apply because the Tachi Palace Casino Resort is situated on tribal lands. The casino also did not follow the state executive stay-at-home order. Dana White stated that he would bring a big fight to the Tachi Palace Casino Resort in the future. I'm going to bring them a big fight, and I appreciate them um, standing with me uh, in, the, in this thing. The fight eventually took place on May 9th, 2020, and it was a fight for the ages. Francis landed one of his winging hooks, and that was all it took. Oh! Oh! It's all Rosen Strike is out! And Ganu! Out! Bad! See, that's what we're talking about. The left hook took his opponent down, and a couple of follow up strikes gave him the first round knockout win in just 20 seconds, as well as the performance of the Night Award. The fight was a testament of the juggernaut Nganu really is when he's unleashed. No more was the tepid Nganu. Now we were starting to see the real predator come out to play. The one that struck fear in his opponent's hearts. Nganu during that period was evidently more cheerful than before. Like he's come to believe in his talents, work ethic, and the team behind him. He started to believe in himself, and that's all it took to get to the next level, where the then reigning champ awaited. A chance for a rematch. The first bout between Stipe, Miocic, and Nganu went overwhelmingly in favor of the Cleveland native. Miocic bothered Nganu with takedowns and ground-and-pound beatings, being mindful to avoid getting his lights out from the bombs that are in Nganu's hands. What was Francis' greatest strength was also his greatest weakness. It seemed that he relied on his power as a crutch, confident that that's enough to get the job done. It wasn't. When I look at that fight, I hate to watch that fight because I don't recognize myself. And I want to avenge that and prove that I'm the best. The rematch with Majocic for the UFC Heavyweight Championship title was held on March 27, 2021 at UFC 260. Dipe versus Engano was extremely uncompetitive. All three judges had it the same way, which was every round Stipe and not a maybe about it. So then you are left with the question of, well, what's going to be different? Is Engano changed? 
This was Francis' chance to get a retribution for the loss he had at the hands of Majocic. I definitely want to fight against Stipe. I would like to have the belt uh, where I left it. To prove doubters wrong and to prove to the world that he's more than just a knockout artist. From the very start, Nganu showed that he's a different fighter than he was during the first fight. He wasn't afraid to wrestle and took the time to circle his opponent, waiting for him to make a mistake and punish him for it. That was beautiful. Oh, that kick from Nganu out of the southpaw stance. Wow. A true predator hunting for its prey. Daniel Cormier said during the fight that an Nganu that isn't afraid to wrestle is a scary thought. He was right. Majocic struggled during the first round and was nearly knocked out after a barrage of Nganu's punches landed square on his face. Shoots right Miocic! ...to get it done in round one, it's time to rip up... He persevered in the first round, but not for long. At the start of the second round, Nganu and Majocic exchanged a few blows. Majocic caught Francis with a jab that seemed to destabilize Nganu and went to seize his advantage. And leave these big openings. Oh, knocked down for Nganu! Stipe back to his feet, he's another uppercut. There, he met a vicious left hook that blew Majocic's lights out. It was a convincing victory for the new heavyweight champ. The winner and new heavyweight champion of the world. The question was, was Nganu a better wrestler this time around than the first time? We got that answer early. Now I gotta give Nganu, he stood his ground. He got his leg back. He even went for a takedown of his own, so we had that question answered. Francis Nganu, he's in control of this sport and I am excited for the future. Now the only thing he needed to prove is that he could hold on to that belt. His next opponent was the French native Surreal Bongamon Gone, a former kickboxer and teammate of Nganu during their stint as teammates at MMA Factory in Paris. Gone became interim UFC heavyweight champion by defeating Derek Lewis at UFC 265. And with Francis winning the UFC Heavyweight Championship title from Majocic, a unification match was therefore to be expected. Cyril Gunn is a strange breed of heavyweight talent. His fighting IQ is off the charts, and he picks away at his opponents like minced meat, combining his intelligence with technique and power. He was a strange and scary opponent for Nganu, who was yet to prove his mettle in defending his belt. It, there's a lot of levels to this, right, with these two guys. I don't believe that there's a there's a hatred. But there is a dislike. Nganu saying during sparring that he knocked Gon out. Can you repeat this, Francis? You, you went to the floor, Cyril. Gon doesn't necessarily agree with that. No, this is not the truth. Oh, you don't remember. Oh, you're a liar. So it's, he was knocked out, probably, because he doesn't remember. There's so many different things that are going on here behind the scenes. You gotta remember who we're dealing with. We're dealing with two behemoths. They're just kind of pulling, pushing, pulling, pushing. And then we'll see. Ultimately, you get the fight. That's the beauty in this game. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event of the evening. This is the moment you've all been waiting for. Has right. noticed those on his opponent, Francis. At the start of the fight, Gon stifled Nganu's power punching with a clinch heavy game plan that saw him tie up the champion any time he got within boxing range. In the second round, he continued to kick Nganu's legs and body, keeping Nganu off balance and opening the lead on the scorecards. Then Nganu did the improbable. Seeing that he didn't have much success on the feet, 
With Gon eluding most of his attempts at a knockout, he took Gon down for the first time in his career. Then he did it again, and again. He remained on top of Gon for the majority of the fourth round, wearing down the Frenchman who was flabbergasted by the surprising round game that Nganu was showing. What started out as a barn fight ended as a full-blown wrestling match. In the end, Nganu did much better than Gon, earning himself the unanimous win in his first title defense. A tough start. I think there are strong indicators that Cyril Gon could eventually become the undisputed UFC heavyweight champion. Still, class of the big men, Cameroon's Francis Ngannou. After the bout, Ngannou revealed that he suffered a serious knee injury in his preparation that hindered his performance in the octagon during the fight. Again, it was a new Ngannou that we witnessed in the Gon fight. A more seasoned, wiser veteran finally coming out from his cocoon, showcasing his evolution from a devastating striker to an all-around MMA assassin. Francis Ngannou, ladies and gentlemen, the heavyweight champion of the world! Talk started of a mega fight with John Jones, a trilogy with Miocic, or a rematch with Gon. However, Ngannou was growing disillusioned with the UFC and their attitude towards fighter pay. Ngannou has repeatedly said that the promotion is making you feel like you're negotiating, but they're getting most of the money and leaving fighters with change. They pay you whatever they want to pay you. They let you pretend that you're negotiating while you're not negotiating. Because whether you say yes or no, you're going to fight. So what is the point? They just offer you a little bit more money this is not a contract, this is the ownership. I don't want to be owned by somebody, I just want to be free. He also blasted the UFC for their sponsorship strategy with fighters, revealing that he once lost a lucrative deal because of the UFC's partnership with Crypto.com. They've stopped you fighters from wearing your own sponsor. For having your own sponsor, exactly. because those guys was having sponsor. This is fighter source of revenue. Whoosh has been taken from them by a promotion. All of that made Nganu in no rush to return to the octagon. News has surfaced of even a potential boxing match with Tyson Fury. We want to find out who is the baddest motherfucker on the planet. Who knows what he'll do next, but it seems that Nganu has evolved more than just in martial arts. Today, Nganu is a man who knows what he's worth. When he set off on foot through Nigeria, walking for miles and sleeping wherever he could, hoping that he wouldn't die out of hunger or thirst or be killed by strangers, he didn't know what destiny awaited him. He only hoped for the best and expected the worst. And he knew that he just needed to make one more step. then another, and then another, hoping that all of those steps would add up to something magnificent. Thousands of miles by foot in the desert, swimming through the cold waters with strangers, climbing on chain-link fences that sliced his skin. Nothing could defeat Francis in his fight for a better life. Six times he was denied entrance in Spain by Moroccan forces before making it on his seventh try. Those same forces that are doing much more than denying entrance to thousands of African migrants today. But Nganu didn't give up. He just kept trying, knowing there wasn't another option. He burned all bridges then, and he's not afraid to do the same now. He's taking it step by step, knowing that one of his next steps will lead to something magnificent.
As of August 2022, our documentary started getting copyright claimed by Combat Sport Promotions. This means, once claimed, we do not earn any money from these videos. With your support, we can continue expanding our dedicated production team, and of course, creating one-of-a-kind content here on YouTube. Please show your support to us through our link below.